Welcome everyone to another episode of Kiwi Talks. My guest today is a voice actor who is probably best known for voicing Sniper and Team Fortress 2, as well as various other characters for Valve. He is the legend that is John Laurie. How are you doing? I'm not doing well, man. How are you? <laughs> good, good. Thank you for taking time out and doing this. Sure, Reese. Yeah. One one thing I actually wanted to give you praise for is is the fact that you nailed the Australian accent with Sniper. Oh, well, thank you very much, mate. I mean, it's a, it's always good to hear from from somebody from from that region of the world. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, particularly because uh, a lot of people in the Northern Hemisphere can't tell the difference between a New Zealand accent and an Australian accent, right? But, right. Right. But obviously, and you Aussies do. give you and Aussies give you Kiwis uh, crap we, about the way you talk. I, they do, mate. They do. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you find that accent? Because I know you watched a lot of Australian television. I think Rake was one of the series that you loved, right? In order right, to... right. Yeah. Well, I mean, Rake is just a fabulous series. I do. Uh, this is a, I mean, there are a whole bunch of series that I, that I love um, that are produced there. Um, but, but the thing is you can, you can really study uh, an accent. I mean, you're, you're, your job as someone who is trying to reproduce an accent is to actually find out what the vowel substitutions are, what the consonant substitutions are. And, uh, and there are various websites you can go to, particularly now, now back when, when I, when they uh, had me audition back in what, 2005 or four or something like that. Um, there were far fewer, uh, 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 resources online. You know, now you can, practically find people from every town in the world, you know, that are willing to put something online about how you talk as if you are from my town. Um, I had done a lot of uh, British accents um, and just, you know, uh, detailing the difference between the way a uh, uh, middle-class person in London speaks as opposed to an upper-class person, as opposed to a person from Leeds or Manchester or, or you know, the, the, I mean, there's so many accents in the British Isles. And I also did a lot of accents from America. And there are lots of accents from this country too. And, and, and all that work just tunes your ear to the specific melody and the particular vowel substitutions and, uh, you know, like a, uh, somebody from the middle class in London would say father like this, father. My father would do this, my father would do that. Um, whereas somebody from Australia would say father, you know. Mm. And uh, and so, you know, you just you just tune into those to those little things. And uh, I mean, that's how you learn any accent, really. Now, and I've been studying the New Zealand accent, and there's some very interesting little specific vowel substitutions that you do. And but I'm really not up on. I mean, I I don't. I would not feel confident doing a New Zealand accent now. I would need to. I would need to go study for a while. It's it's a pretty hard accent to do, actually. There's very few. Right. Uh, very 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 few people that I know in America that can get it right. It's, it's, you go. It's a very it's a very hard accent. E accent. It is. You know that 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 you you close down that the the a becomes an almost an e. E. Yeah. E, yeah. E. You know an accent. Um, and. And Aussies don't really do that much, you know. I mean, they're I mean, accent. They they would you know they still have the air. They it's closed down a little bit, but it's not. But it's not as closed as as in New Zealand. But then there are some other things that you do that are just unexpected. And and I'd have to just go back and look at all of them to to really talk about it intelligently. <laughs> so when you're when you're studying accent, is the first part to try and nail the vowels and consonants and then would you maybe go listen to a lot of accents first and then no first what i do is listen okay first so that's what, what you do, do first listen. yeah 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 uh, i listen to you know if to, to study the australian accent i would listen to australian act actors which are the only people that i have really you know access to um i needed to do a south african accent uh for one project and fortunately we knew some people from south africa that lived here in seattle and i went to their house and listened to them talk and stuff like that and uh, and they do the they do similar things to the kiwis they'll, they'll say like medicine instead of medicine hmm. you know it's very 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 closed down and uh and so but uh th there's oh God. there was a there was a, a couple of new zealand new zealand tv shows that i watched recently 
that I really enjoy, the kind of murder mystery procedurals. Um, oh boy, I forget the titles of them right now. Was it but a series listen... or the series or films? Y- y- yeah, it was a series. Mm. Um, uh, one Lane Bridge? One Lane Bridge is one of them. Yeah. 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 Uh, and uh, oh, and uh, Top of the Top of the Lake, I think. Might be. But I might not. I, yeah. I actually right. haven't but watched I, But I think a that's lot. actually yeah. a, a British series filmed in New Zealand or something like that. Possibly. Yeah. The was, was English. Um, but, uh, and, but there was another one, about, uh, I just can't remember, but anyway, you know, and I, and I just love, cause every once in a while something will pop up and like, boy, that's just not what I would expect the New Zealand accent to do, but it does it consistently. So, but I would, but I would have to go back and just check. So when you're watching any type of series with a foreign accent, mm-hmm. do you sit there and almost try and imitate it at points? Right. Right. Well, well, as I'm watching, I'll just kind of clock things. It's like, oh, okay, they don't say ah, they say ah. Oh, they don't say oh, they say uh, or something like that. You know, <laughs> so I'll just I'll just I'll just clock those things. Um and uh you know, and foreign accents are just as as interesting. Um the interesting thing to me about foreign accents is uh say if you if you want to go do a German accent, it's important to know where your character learned how to speak English. If he speak learned how to speak English from an English person. You know, he would talk like this. He was very precise and stuff like that. Uh, if he learns English from an American person, he would talk like this, more like Arnold Schwarzenegger, <laughs> because, you know, he didn't have any English when he came to America. And so he learned to speak English from Americans. And so he's very large and very boisterous. But, you know, the, the kind of the class, classic evil Nazi, those were all played by, you know, German actors who learned English from British people or British actors who were affecting a German accent. And so it's always very precise and, you know, are your papers in order and stuff like that. So how do you know how to do an accent and not make it sound comical, right? Because you can imitate an accent and sometimes it can come off like, like a comedian would do it as opposed to well, doing right, it for right. an actual voice role. Well, and I think, and this really has to do with craft. Um, you know, you can see a bad painting of an ocean and it looks like a cartoon. You see a really good painting of the ocean, it really looks like the ocean. And that has to do with how well-trained the painter's eye is and how well he uses color and, and light and all that kind of stuff. Um, to, you know, well, I have my lucky charms, you know, is a cartoonish Irish accent. But if I'm spending a lot of time listening to people from Limerick or from Dublin or from Northern Ireland. I mean, there are a whole bunch of regional accents in Ireland as well. And the, the, the better I can be at actually reproducing the way they talk, the more it's going to sound like an actual Irish person and not someone faking it. And my goal always is to sound like an actual person. Well, you pull it off. Because it never oh, sounds. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you always you always sound very very good in the role, and it sounds completely natural. I'm just I'm so amazed at how many accents you can actually do, and do it flawlessly well, as well. Well, of course, I started out as a composer and a musician. Yeah, that's and right. So there was a lot of a lot of ear training there too, because a lot of the way people talk is just the melody of how they talk. Um, people on the east coast of the United States, uh, northeast coast, like from say. Philadelphia North tend to speak pretty quickly. Um, people in the South of the United States tend to speak slower. Um, uh, it, I find that there are similarities between all big city accents. If it's a Berlin accent or a London accent or a Chicago accent or a New York accent or a Philadelphia accent or a Boston accent, working class big city people tend to talk right in the face, right in the mask, because they're always trying to get over a lot of noise. And rich people tend to speak more back in their, in their, in their throats because they don't, you know, they, they can talk very softly and still, you know, every, you know, anything they want is at the snap of the finger, but poor people actually have to communicate. And so it's all very forward, all very forward in the mask. So, and, and it's true, you know, it's true if you're a Cockney in, in London, uh, yeah, it's it's true if you're a you know if you're a working guy in Chicago or you know or New York or Boston, it's you know all very bright and all very forward. 
It's fascinating. So how, how long did it take you to really learn all this stuff? Or did you just oh, set yourself aside and just, you just always, well, always I haven't stopped to learning learn. yet. I mean, well, that's good. you know, there, there are 8 billion people on the planet. That means there's 8 billion accents. Is there any accent so, you struggle to, to do the most? Um, or the, well, one, that took, that or just, the one that took you the longest to get right? Well, well some you kind of lose, you know, uh, uh, I mean, I have a lot in me now, but say if if someone said, okay, well, do somebody from from Minneapolis, I have to think about it for a minute. You know, okay, okay, well, we're from Minneapolis and we talk very flat and, uh, you know, we tell a lot of jokes and we had a lot of laughs and stuff like that. Um, but but I'd want to listen to some people if I, if I had a job, you know, I mean, if I'm at a fan con or something like that, and it's just, you know, pull an accent out of your pocket. Okay, sure, I can pull out a pretty good accent. But, you know, if I'm actually, if I'm doing a game or something like that, then I will make sure that I, that I really dig in and, uh, and, and, and find the details because there are, you know, just a million little details in every accent. And of course, as an actor, the last thing you want to do is be acting the accent. You want the accent to be so normal to you that you can then actually do the job of an actor and want what your character wants and right. try to win your arguments and, and convince people and stuff like that. So what was the back and forth that you had with a lot of the writers? Cause they would have overseen you when you were recording your lines, right? Like with, with Valve, right. whether it was Chet or Eric or Jay, do you remember mm -hmm. a, a lot of the, the dynamic? Well, and of course, and, and Bill Van Buren was always there too. Yeah. Bill, yeah, yeah. Um, um, uh, well, I mean, the, uh, you know, the, the channel, when I first got into video games, the people who were making video games were basically all coders. They were all, they were all people that loved to design puzzles and loved to program computers. They had no idea what to do with actors. And, uh, and so the direction you would get wouldn't be any direction at all. You just get, cause you're probably familiar that, you know, when you record lines for video games, it's not like a script in a movie or a script in a play. You just get a bunch of lines. Yeah. Well, and that's you right. You don't know who you're listening to. You don't know who you're talking to. And it took a few years, uh, I'd say three or four, three or four or five years before people who were writing for video games knew enough about acting to be able to interact productively with an actor and give them direction that they actually could benefit from. Um, and by the time I started working for Valve, those guys knew their stuff. I mean, uh, uh, Chet and, uh, and Eric and Jay were all great. And uh, they knew the kind of information that an actor needs to be able to give a convincing performance. Basically, we need to know where we are, who we, you know, who we're talking to, and what we want. And uh, and all those guys and Bill Van Buren as well were great at just giving that information. Um, and sometimes it's very basic, like you know, are we in a noisy place or are we in a high, in a quiet place? Do we need to yell across bombs going off, or are we sneaking around and we don't want to be heard and stuff like that? So do you interact with a lot of props or anything or try to get your body into certain movements to try to get into a character? Well, I think, you know, uh, it's it's important to to allow your character to be in your body. Uh, the the trick with, with voice acting is you can do anything you want with any part of yourself except your head. Your head has to maintain its relationship to the microphone. Right. Because you get into physics, you get into the Doppler effect and stuff like that. If you're moving away from the microphone, it does weird things. If you're moving toward the microphone, it does weird things. Not to mention the level, you know, driving the engineer crazy as far as trying to get a good level. On what you're <laughs> yeah, doing. yeah. So you can do all this kind of stuff that you want as long as your head stays absolutely still. Right. And and of course, there's no props, there's no sets, nothing like that. You have to make it all up. You have, it's uh, it's theater of the mind, as some voice actors uh, call it. Because in, in most acting, film acting, stage acting, anything like that, you know, the, the, the golden rule is acting is always reacting. You're always reacting to what you're given. Um, you want to respond to what the other actor is doing and stuff like that. You never want to make up what your guy is going to do, no matter what anybody else does. But in voice acting, you don't have that. You're actually making up what you're listening to. You're making up the scene in your head. And, uh, and so that's, I mean, that's a unique part of voice acting that, uh, is just completely opposite of every other kind of acting. The rest of it is the same. You know, you, you always want to know what your, 
what your motivation is, what you want to try, try to accomplish, who you want to convince of what, what your attitudes are, uh, you know, of, of to, about the, the people that you're talking to and the situation that you're in. Um, but that one thing, you have to make up your own world to respond to as a voice actor in video games. Did you get much leeway to do any ad libbing? Well, well, yeah. I mean, in in a lot of video game dialogue, you know, the writers write these lines because they know what needs to happen, and so you need to, you know, you need to to give them the lines that they've written. But then, you know, if if I'm, you know, if I'm reading a, a some similar lines, and then something occurs to me, and I'll say that too. And sometimes, particularly with uh, with Eric and Jay and Chet, you know, that if I'd say something that they weren't expecting. They say, okay, that's great. Hold for a second. And the writers go off and confer. And then they come out with a whole bunch of new lines. It was, you know, inspired by some ad lib that I did. Um, so it was very, uh, very uh, collaborative in that way. But really, you know, because of just the mechanics of the game, there are some things they need the characters to say yeah. so that the player can get on to the next thing, you know. Makes sense. So you say that they go out and they they talk about things and then they come back. What are you doing during well, that time? Well, they don't doing, go like, anywhere. Well, yeah. Well, just, yeah. But are you just standing there? Just waiting? Right, exactly. For really? Yeah, but how, yeah. How the long mic's you, turned how, off. I can't hear what they're saying. But how long are you and standing or waiting there for? You know, five minutes, ten minutes, whatever it takes. And you just you totally, totally well, have a sip of water. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, just relaxing for a while. Yeah, it's 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 really funny. And then they'll come back with these zany ideas, particularly those guys at Valve. You know, the zany are us. They they just were you know insane, insane guys as far as you know, no no idea was too weird. And if you think it is, I refer you to the owl head that I had to be for a while. You know. Yeah. What am I? A sniper. Hoot on owl. You know. <laughs> One of my favorite games that I only found out recently that you you worked on this, but it was Total Annihilation, and you were the narrator. Oh, right, right. Yeah. Um, do you recall much about that experience? Well, it was early on in in the uh, in the video game world as far as interacting with actors, but those guys basically knew what they wanted, and uh, you know they said, you know, you're just this old narrator. You're the keeper of the history of this galaxy. And, uh, and, you know, and this is what's happened to it. You know, all the people are gone, all the, all the beings are gone. All that's left are the war machines that they made and there's no off switch. So the, the only possible end of the war is when there's only one machine left, you know, basically. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, and, and they're really nice. Uh, of course I have a funny story about that. I, you know, I mean, I'm the narrator and in, in those old days, you know, they, they, they didn't have the computers didn't have the capacity to have a bunch of actors wandering around saying lines during the game. Uh, they didn't have the ability to animate people that way. I remember I was when I did the first No One Lives Forever, they had just perfected the software for make, moving the jaw with the recording so that they could feed a recording of the actor into the computer and the computer would automatically move the jaw like this. And so, you know, my the characters all talked like that because they're, they're, they hadn't figured out the lips and tongue yet. And then when I did uh, No One Lives Forever 2, they figured out that too. And this solves 99% of your animation woes, right? The hardest part about animation is just getting the mouth to move correctly. And when you just have software so that you can put a recording into the software and the software makes the character's mouth move as a person speaking would move it, then you don't have to hire people that, you know, Disney was drawing 24 drawings per second to get that to happen. And now with, with computers that they just do it automatically. Um, but, but of course on, in, in, in uh, total annihilation, I was just a narrator. And so I would narrate for a while and there'd be a nice little movie that would kind of tell the story. And then you get into the game itself. Right. Yeah. Well, I gave the game to my nephew, and uh, and it was a it was a PC game, and I and I'm a Mac guy, and so I'd never been able to see it. I'd never been able to play it, and so I gave my it to my nephew, and he finally got in the computer that was fast enough to play it. And we went down there to see him, and he loaded, he put the you know the CD in the CD drive, and it loaded up for I don't know 25 minutes or something like that, and finally it was ready to go. And my wife, you know, Ellen came in, and she wanted to see it too. And, you know, the lights went down on the screen and my narration voice starts talking, you know, 
4,000 years ago. The guy, and my nephew was going, escape, escape, escape. He didn't want to listen to the narration. He just wanted to get into the game. Right? And so Alan said, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's your uncle. I want to hear that. And he literally did this. He looked at her and went, and he started it over again. <laughs> So that's the kind of respect you get from your loved ones when you're a voice actor. Oh, well, maybe maybe they, they appreciate it when, when they're older, right? <laughs> I guess so. Right? <laughs> yeah, he was only like eight or nine at the time. You know, he yeah, was just yeah. impatient. He Sorry, he doesn't, he doesn't feel that way now? Hopefully. No, 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 I don't think so. No. <laughs> okay, that's good. That's good. Do you have a personal preference in terms of voice acting or theater? Is there one you prefer over the other? Oh, uh, well, I mean, the the, the thing that, stands out about voice acting far above any other kind of acting is the utter lack of waiting you go there and all you have are your lines right, right. i mean i certainly i enjoy live performance i always have so i've always enjoyed uh you know i mean i was a guitarist for many years and uh and uh, and a theater actor and you know it, just interacting with a live audience is unique and you won't find anything like it anywhere else and that's great hmm. um but you know a lot of times you're backstage waiting to go on and stuff like that while the play is going on um in film it's four thousand times worse you know i've gotten on film sets where you know i'm i'm, I'm called to the set at 6 30 in the morning and i don't get on camera until three in the afternoon because other things are going on so there's just a whole lot of waiting in in film work but if, when you're a voice actor they have rented the studio and rented you and they want to use you the whole time. So you're just, you are just working the whole time. And that's a lot of fun. It sounds like a better model for a better production pipeline. I would think, I mean, how much money would you burn if you're just sitting around on film and it wouldn't be just you, it'd be all these other people, right. That are just waiting around to just do what they need to do. Right. Well, but of course, you know, when you think about it, I mean, every scene needs to be lighted every scene needs to be dressed you know i mean there are all these things that need to happen in order for the crew to be ready to actually start the camera and there are other actors in the scene too and and any scene that you see in a movie has actually been shot at least five times hmm. you know they'll they'll do a coverage shot where they just sh sh shoot the whole scene a good three times at least and then they'll do an over the shoulder shot from one character and over the shoulder shot from other character, close ups, all kinds of angles, what they call coverage to make sure that they have everything that they need when they edit it all together. And every one of these scenes has to be shot. And so you might be saying the same line over and over again when the camera is in a different place. Um, and all the other actors are doing that too. So there's just a whole lot of stuff that goes into making a movie. Um, and there's a whole lot of stuff that goes into making a video game, but it, all that stuff goes on when I'm not around. You know, when they hire me, they're ready to just record my lines and I come in and record them. Hmm. Did you ever try and advocate to do any composing on games that you've worked on since you're a musician? I have uh, uh, on the game, The Church in the Darkness. I uh, yeah. wrote wrote five original songs and arranged uh, another five. Um. But I haven't I haven't river really hung out my shingle as as a composer for for games because that was, you know, by the time I got into games, I was just I was just being an actor pretty much full time. Um, I've I've gotten back into composing now that I'm doing. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the Search for Sandwich videos that we've been putting out. Yes, I was going to ask you about that, but yep, right. And, and and in the last couple, I've actually composed some music for. Ah, oh, so for those. it's your music. We, in in uh, in the Battle of the Breads, in Battle of the Breads, uh, uh, episode one and two, hmm. um, and and the and the music over the closing credits. That's me playing the guitar with myself, recorded. I mean, I'm I'm playing both parts. It's a guitar duet that I wrote. That's cool, man. You really are multi talented, aren't you? <laughs> well, you know, I like to say that I can do anything but hold a steady job. You know, <laughs> so, <laughs> well, it's a lot more exciting than a steady nine to five right right well and and also you, you notice that all the art forms that i'm involved with take place in time not in space i'm not a painter i'm not a sculptor you know uh i mean i've, I've written a novel but that's a story that takes in place in time i direct and edit uh audio shows 
And those, once again, take place in time. Theater takes place in time. Music takes place in time. So every art takes place in time. That's where I'm really at my at my best. Mm. So how did the search for the sandwich, search for the sandwich come about? How did that whole thing even start? <laughs> So our friend Andrew Ho, who now works for Streamly, who that we sign online uh, autographs through, um, he was a guy who was met us as a fan down in, in Georgia, uh, and uh, and then as he got out of college and started working and stuff like that, he started interacting with us on a more professional level and became our web publicist and, and things like that. And he thought it would be a good idea to gather as many of the Team Fortress Two crowd crew, you know, together as he could. And, you know, we tried to get Grant Goodeve and we tried to get Nathan Vetterline, but they just weren't interested. And, and Rick May sadly passed away uh, early on in the COVID pandemic. Um, but Robin, well, and, and Ellen and Gary and Dennis and I live, all live in Seattle where Valve is. And then, and then, but he, he, uh, Andrew managed to contact Robin Atkin Downs and, uh, and said, why don't you come up for, um, uh pax west in seattle which we did uh last last fall and we had already done a streamly signing that was wildly successful in the spring and uh it seemed like this might be something that people were were ready for were, were interested in in seeing after all this time was a gathering of the tf2 crew and so we all met at uh, pax and did a panel and it was a great success and signed autographs and robin just had this idea that we go into a local local little coffee shop, Delicatessen, right there at the convention center, and ask for a sandwich in our character voices. Because, of course, the sandwich, you know, is a thing in yeah. the game. You know, Heavy likes it. And Robin voices Medic, and there's maybe a thing going on between Heavy and Medic, and all this kind of stuff. And so he said, hey, let's, let's go in and ask for a sandwich in our character voices, and I'll film it. And he put it up on Twitter, and, you know, it got like 500,000 views, and, you know, the gaming... Uh, in uh publications you know pc gamer and all this kind of stuff wrote, wrote articles about it and we thought okay well if that's if people are that interested in, let, let's just do some more and they started out very simple you know robin when he got back to la he just went into a convenience store and asked for a sandwich and and i uh came up with a an idea to you know, since, since, since the stop is australian right and there's that other guy and i'll forget his name but he'd had that wildlife show you know, where you're always going out, you know, the crocs over there. Oh, Steve you know, Irwin. Seeing that. Yeah, right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. I said, oh, I could I could be, you know, out in the wild looking for the sandwich. And so I did one of those. And then uh, I knew that that Gary uh, lived just in a little town called North Bend, uh, not too far from here, right at the edge of the mountains. And uh, I thought I wanted to go out and do one with him. Uh, and, you know, uh, Dennis was still overseas at that time. He was on a trip to Greece or something like that. And so, and and... And North Bend was the place where they filmed the show Twin Peaks. And Gary said, I thought it'd be cool if we could do like a kind of a, have a Twin Peaks reference in there somewhere. And I thought, oh, well, I know Liz McCarthy, who was the giggling secretary in the film Twin Peaks Firewalk with me. And so I called her up and said, hey, man, you want to, we're doing this stupid thing. You want to come out and giggle in the background? And she said, sure. So we all drove out to North Bend and did that. And, uh, and then Dennis got back and I had this idea that we could go on the ferry and do all this stupid stuff on the ferry. And they just cut, started getting more and more involved. And, uh, and it's just been a lot of fun. We've just kind of added, added things each time, but, but really how it started was Robin just had this idea. We'd go into the delicatessen and ask for a sandwich. It's crazy. It's crazy. The domino effect of everything, right? I know, I know. <laughs> well, you get a bunch of maniac actors together and, and, you know, they just come up with all kinds of zany stuff. So it's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Didn't you do one in, was it Peru? You did one? Yes. Ep yes. Episode? Yeah. So was that, was that right. planned I, that you were going to go to Peru to do that? Or was it just something that was implemented because you were going there anyway? No, I got a gig. Uh, so, you know, I also voiced seven characters in Dota 2. Yeah, that's right. And, yeah. and Ellen does two characters in Dota 2. And, of course, Dota 2 is a very Huge. much worldwide... Yeah, yeah, play, and and they have a thing called the International, which is the World Championships of Dota that I announce the teams in, and I do some, you know, I do some narration under the video and stuff like that in at every every year at the International, and for the first time, they had what's called a major, which is the level below the World Championships that people have to pass through to get invited to the World Championships, 
And the, for the first time, they had one in South America, in, in Lima, Peru. And uh, the people who were organizing that that major contacted Ellen and I and said, would you, you know, could we get you to come down here and be a part of this event? Wow. And so I said, sure. You know, and so, you know, and they paid us a nice fee and they flew us down there, put us up in a wonderful hotel and it was a great time. And like two days before we left, I thought, wait a minute, I could do a sandwich episode down there. <laughs> and so real quick, we called up Liz McCarthy, you know, and said, hey man, can you be this mysterious woman for this short scene? And just to set up so that I'm going down there as, you know, to, to try to find the sandwich, so. That's awesome. Because you've been to so many places around the world, right? Obviously Peru, you've been to Sweden, uh, mm -hmm. Qatar, like... Oh, Dubai. 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 I've been to Qatar. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, Baja and the Bahamas and, of course, all over the States and England a couple of times. And so, yeah, anytime we go anywhere now, when we went to PAX East at Boston, we had to film a couple episodes there. We had to film the medic getting back together with Heavy, and that was a big, you know, big uh, joyous scene. And then I did uh, Existential Onks, which was, you know, centered on the spy talking philosophically in a lonely bar. Mm. I'm surprised you haven't done one in Australia yet. Australia or New Zealand. Yeah. You haven't done an expo there yet. Like there's a PAX in Australia. Oh, I know. I know. And we're trying to, we're trying to see if we can get invited there. I mean, for one reason or another, they've never invited us. Uh, I'm, I'm going there. I'm, I'm doing something there this October. So I'll, I'll, try is, and put, that... I'll put in a good word for you. Well, right, well, the, the October one is the one we're trying to get to now. That's yeah. the one in Brisbane, right? Uh, it's Melbourne. Yeah. Oh, October, Melbourne. Right, 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 October right. October right. 6th, I think it is. Yeah. Something like that. Right, yeah. right. And there's there's a couple in October. There's one in London in October they're trying to get to and one in, in, in the PAX in, in Australia. But, you know, the, the, the con itself has to have an interest in us being there because we can't, you know, we need them to fly us there and, and all this kind of stuff. We can't yeah. just go on our own dollar. So, so a lot so, of the time... Yeah, just, Hmm. Sorry, I was just going to ask. A lot of the time, do people just contact you to do these events overseas? Right. When yeah. we go to cons, you don't really advocate the con for contacted it. us. Right, right. Yeah, the one thing I've learned is you don't really want to go to a con if people don't want you there. <laughs> yeah, you know, fair enough. If, if, you know, you just end up wandering around saying, "No, nobody's going to pay attention to me." Huh? Okay, well, I guess I'll go home. Um, but if there's a reason for you to be there, and there's a fan base that say, "Oh yeah, we want to see these guys," well, then it's a great time. And uh, so we're just we're just seeing uh, how the it's one of the reasons that we're doing all these sandwich videos is just to, you know, raise our presence on the on the Web and let people know that we're still out there kicking and uh, and see if they want to see us. No, I, I think they're really, really good. I think I think it's so good. And I, you should definitely keep them up for as long as you can, as long as you. Oh, have, yeah. Yeah. You can maintain the energy and the enthusiasm <laughs> and and the ideas keep coming. To do it then yeah well and i think that particularly with tf2 because um for various reasons and i won't get into it but you know uh valve kind of moved on from tf2 they've kept the game alive but they haven't really there haven't been any major updates or new maps or anything like that for a long time and i think the people that play it love these characters and they want more content they want more story and so when we started putting out a new story they just loved it and it, you know we once again, these things have gone viral and, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of views and magazine articles and on all this kind of stuff. So. Well, I think that there's also a huge need, or I shouldn't say need, I suppose a want from the community for a Team Fortress 3, right? I think they'd want absolutely. all you guys back for a Team Fortress 3. And if, if you know, Gabe Newell hadn't been assaulted by a three when he was three years old <laughs> on the 3rd of March... You know uh, that that we have a chance, but <laughs> but but really, yeah. I mean, I, I it's it's interesting. Valve is their own company, and I and I uh, I don't really. I'm, it's not my place to talk about how they work or 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 you know what kind of decisions they make. But uh, we know that you know that there can be people who work there that have a lot of enthusiasm for this or that project. But of course, putting a game together means gathering a lot of people. And uh, because Valve is a flat company, there's no boss. There's nobody who says, okay, this is what we're doing now. Yeah. It's really all just collaboration. You know, you, have, you get, you know, you have to gather people and say, hey, are you interested in doing this? Because it's going to take, you know, a couple of years and we're hoping that it'll make money and all this kind of stuff. So it's a, it's a challenge, but I love working with the guys and the, and the, the, the creative teams there are just so, so incredibly 
fecund, so rich with ideas and stuff like that. That it's been it's been great working with the guys over the years. Did you at any point have any interaction with Gabe? Have you actually met him? <laughs> I've been on the same stage with him, but he was like fifty feet away. That's as close as I've gotten to him. <laughs> he seems to be like this aura that very few people can seem to get to. <laughs> well, you know the. the uh, when you when you work at a video game company, a lot of the work is avoiding fan emails, because if you just just very briefly answered every fan email, you'd never get anything else done. Yeah. And so you know, in order to actually make games, they have to kind of have a buffer zone between them and and all the questions that fans want to ask them. Yeah, I suppose you get a lot of fan mail. Uh, not an unmanageable amount you know i try to uh i mean of course it's all electronic you know and uh, i get a lot of uh, messages on uh, on my facebook page and on my uh, youtube page and on twitter and uh, and i try to keep up with those as best i can Hmm. i wanted to ask you about the because obviously you spoke about it before the novel that you wrote dancing with eternity Mm -hmm. right how do you feel in regards to the whole chat GPT thing and how it's changing, how narrative is getting written. Like if you were to write that same novel today, would Mm -hmm. you use chat GPT as a tool to help you or would you completely ignore it? Oh, no, 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 no. Uh -uh. Uh, That's just not the way I work. Uh, the, The fun part is creating. Why would I want a tool to like create some of the stuff? I well, I suppose all of the stuff. if you had a strict deadline, I, I imagine with some writers, if they have a strict deadline, then they might use it as a tool. That's what I'm you know thinking. Douglas Adams, who who wrote uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Yeah, he had my favorite quote about about deadlines. He said, "I love deadlines. I love the whooshing sound they make as they go by." <laughs> I mean, the, the, the dissonance and the abrasion between the artistic world and the business world is never going to go away. It's always mm. going to be there. That's right. You know, I mean, the, the, the creator, there are all kinds of tools you can use to become more efficient. If you listen to Mozart and Haydn symphonies who were written in the 18th century, they're all almost formulary, almost formulaic. Same movements, same length, same all, all kinds of stuff because they were writing them as a job and these various aristocrats needed a symphony for this party or a symphony for that party or a string quartet over here or whatever. And they just turn them out, turn them out, turn them out, turn them out. And Mozart wrote 45 symphonies before he was 34. Haydn wrote 105 symphonies. Then you get to somebody like Beethoven and all of a sudden he only writes nine symphonies in his whole life because he, because, because of the, of the whole age of enlightenment and the idea of a human being as a creator Hmm. up through the 18th century the first part of the 18th century creation was reserved to god and by the end of the 18th century we were trying we were starting to think maybe human beings actually have intrinsic value maybe what they want to write what they want to say has value and and so Beethoven would work on his symphonies for a long time and rework melodies and rework melodies. And you can see early versions of his scores that where he scratched things out and rewrote things and done things over and stuff like that, because he wanted it to be what he heard in his head. And it was instead of just some notes in a row to entertain some aristocrats, it was a person trying to tell the truth as well as they could, trying to take the cosmos in and let it back out as purely as they could. And that meant listening to themselves and listening to their own responses to what was going on. Now, by the time we get into the middle of the 20th century, we really start having entertainment industries, right? I mean, you know, in the 19th century, Charles Dickens would do things, he'd have to have a chapter a month or a week or whatever it was for the newspapers that published his novels, you know, in, in episodic form. And so you had, and Alexander Dumas do the same kind of thing, but then you'd also have, you know, somebody like Mark Twain having a conversation with uh, an African-American maid of his about how she lost her son to, to slavers 
and his need to tell that story about slavery and the real and the real racism in in the society he needed to get that out it was only him you know nobody else wanted him to write huckleberry finn he needed to tell the story for his uh, african-american maid who had gone through this horrible experience um you know and you get to, to people like hemingway and and eugene o'neill and all these people they they had the, a voice in them that that needed to be expressed and sometimes this fits in with the industry because you know having published a novel i know that publishers are all about shipping you know that that is you know they're paying to pay you know get make paper and put ink on it and put it in boxes and put the boxes in trucks and get the trucks to bookstores whereas i'm off you know in the world of ideas and all this kind of stuff and so there's always going to be, if it's a record industry or a book publishing industry or a movie industry or a game industry, there's always going to be people who are saying, yeah, that's great, but how are we going to pay for this? How is this going to make money? Because if it doesn't make money, we turn the lights off and we go home and we don't have a company anymore. Right. But the creators have to be creators and they're not on the same page as the money people. And they never will be. And that's fine. You know, you're always going to have this tension between the people who know what we need in order to have an audience and sell stuff and the people who say, yeah, but we're going to have to, we're going to come up with something really cool like Portal that's just zany and completely unexpected and wild. You got to let us go off and be crazy in our own playground. And if we're going to have a game like Team Fortress 2, that, that there has that hasn't been a game really like it since then. You know, even Overwatch, which tried, which basically was a reboot of Team Fortress 2, doesn't have the personality and the style of Team Fortress 2 because it was more of a corporate production, whereas Valve was kind of this nest of zany hippies up here in Seattle, <laughs> figuring out a way to do whatever the crap they wanted to do. And and it it just gave them a lot of latitude to find some really, really crazy stuff that turned out to be very appealing to people. Hmm. It's interesting that you talk I'm about I'm not even that. sure what the original question was. Well, the, qu the, <laughs> the, the original question was in regards to chat GPT and its influence, I suppose, oh, on right, writing. Right. So yeah, so how I mean, I don't know. I'm I'm waiting to chat DBT is is just a very powerful new tool. Yes. Uh, a nuclear bomb is a very powerful new tool, right? Uh, and a, a power drill is a very powerful new tool. You need to learn how to use them to do what you want to do without hurting people. You know, a metal lathe is a fabulous tool. You can do incredible things. You don't want it around children or they will get mangled, right? Yeah. So you put it in a special place and you put a lock on the door and you make sure the children are somewhere else um nuclear power is incredibly powerful and it can allow us to see where the bones are broken and how many cavities you have in your mouth and cure cancer and all this kind of stuff but we need to watch it and we need to guard it um because the power the more powerful it is the more dangerous it is that's just the universe there is nothing that is powerful that is not dangerous um uh, this is how I feel about guns. Guns are just too powerful a tool to just let everybody have everywhere. We need to have some kind of control over them. A lot of people in this country disagree with me, but but to me, anytime you have a new tool, it becomes a challenge. Cocaine in the late 1800s was a new tool. It's like it cured pain you know it could make your toothache go away all this kind of stuff ah, it turns out that there's these problems with it too <laughs> and we have to learn about those problems and deal with them right um so anything like that anytime we find a new powerful thing it allows us to do cool stuff but it's as dangerous as it is powerful so we'll see we'll see how it works out yeah it's 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 a good point you make about how every new thing that comes out there's some people that use it for good and there's some people that use it for evil well, and some people just use it mistakenly, you yeah, know, yeah. and some people just get drunk on the power, you know, uh, if, if somebody came up with something that could give us a 24 hour a day orgasm, 
There are lots of people get great orgasm. I like orgasms. What's wrong with orgasm? Let's have <laughs> orgasms all the time. Well, then you have them all the time and you're just burning billions of calories and you're never eating and you're just laying there drooling. And after a while, it just feels normal. It doesn't feel like an orgasm anymore. It just feels like breathing, right? <laughs> so you know, anytime we anytime we have something like that that's really cool, we have to figure out what's cool about it and how to moderate it. So that I mean, when video games first came out, you know, the big the big almost trite of observation now is, you know, our kids are just sitting in the basement twenty four hours a day playing these video games. And early days, it was kind of the way it was. And the gaming community itself had to learn how to police itself and say, okay, games are great, but stop every once in a while, get some exercise, eat. And, you know, when you're interacting with the, the Dota 2 professional teams, these guys all have coaches that you get them, you know, they're doing, you know, running a certain amount of miles every day, watching their diet, doing all these other things to make sure that they can go in and when they play that they're sharp. And so, and but you know, a video game was just like cocaine. It was this amazing thing. We could go to a hallucination and live there and decide how it worked. And we'd never been able to do that before. We could watch cartoons. We could never walk around in a cartoon and decide which doors to open before. And it was amazing. Mm. And but we had to kind of learn how to manage it so that we wouldn't hurt ourselves and we could and everybody could have fun. Everything in moderation. That's kind of my motto. Because the novelty, yeah, well, and, if, and, if, if you do too much of anything, the novelty wears off, regardless of what it is. And also, you're missing out on everything else. Yeah, that's you know, right. The, the universe is an infinitely complex place, and you don't want to miss the waterfalls and the skies and the sunsets and the mountains because you've decided this one thing is all you want to do. Yeah. But as a writer and as a creator... I have my heroes are the you know the 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 fourth century Chinese sculptors who spend their entire life making this one sculpture and put their own teeth in it and their own hair in it and stuff like that and they don't make a dime off it but it's in a museum now it's a really cool thing um you know Van Gogh sold one painting by himself in his whole life uh, Mozart died a pauper uh we in in our western culture we tend to monetize everything and yeah. commodify everything yeah. and i think we do it to our detriment we lose out on a lot of cool stuff because we think it has to make money or it's not worth it um people who hire people like me have to figure out how to wrangle people like me to get a product done in a reasonable amount of time so that they can keep hiring people like me. And I completely understand that. Um, but I think that the, the mistake I feel that people make about when they're talking about artificial intelligence and artificial self-awareness is they forget a very basic uh, dimension of our own self-awareness. And that is to ask, what is the self that we are aware of? The brain is not aware of itself. The brain doesn't have any nerve endings in itself. The brain is aware of the chemical reactions in our body. The nerve impulses, things that cause electricity to be sent to our brain are all chemical. If we're hungry, that's a chemical imbalance. If we're lonely, that's actually a chemical, a hormonal thing. It's all chemical. It's all chemistry. And until we build, until we can build a computer that is connected to something to be aware of, that is connected to something that gets hungry or gets lonely, then the computer isn't going to have a reason to write, to write music, to express itself. All expression comes from a certain level of discomfort bordering on pain. Uh, many of the, of, the, of the forms that I love, the blues, Dixieland, jazz, gospel, came out of slavery, of this incredible generations of pain, incredible, unfathomable pain, losing children, losing spouses, losing fathers and mothers to, to sales, being sold away. And this happened for centuries. And it gave us this incredibly rich art forms that, that came out of it. Is it worth it? I, I can't say, you know, um, but all art, comes from a need to express 
And if the need to express is only a need to make money, well, that's the level of art you're going to get. And you see a lot of that on television. You know, we need to churn out so many things because we need to sell commercials. And it, as long as we have a certain level of of uh, car chases and explosions and occasional nudity or whatever gets the eyes on the screen, that's what we're going to do. But that's not going to give us Don Quixote. That's not going to give us Hamlet. That's not going to give us the Brahms Requiem or, or Duke Ellington or Jimi Hendrix. That stuff has to come from a need to express. And no artificial intelligence has a need to express. They just have rules that they've learned. They also don't have to worry about money or anything as well, right? I mean, I tend to find with right. They don't get hungry if yeah. you turn the electricity off. They just are turned off. You know, <laughs> they either have electricity or they don't. Yeah, like I even notice, say with YouTube, for example, there is a lot of YouTubers out there that rely on the ad revenue and the monetization mm -hmm. of videos mm -hmm. to put food on the table. So as a result, right. Right. they have to post a video every day and it's that well the that, constant that battle between be quality nice and quantity yeah well tr true true i mean you, you uh i mean once again you can develop tools so that no matter what i write i'm going to make sure it has a good form it's going to do the things that a story needs to do so that when somebody listens to it it's going to be a satisfying story it may not be as really 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 cool as uh as the piece of art that i would like to to make if I had an infinite amount of time. But on the other hand, it's nice having boundaries, having a box, having something you have to fit into. One of the great things about the, the search for sandwich videos, they can't be longer than two minutes and 20 seconds. So whatever story I'm gonna have to tell, I have to fit it into that frame, which is great. You know, it, it's like, okay, well, I, it, the structure, it needs to be, it needs to have the setup, it needs to have the payoff, all within this very confining place. And, and that's made it wonderful for writing because I don't have to worry about how long it is. I know how long it can't be longer than, right? So so uh, uh, there's a thing uh, people like to talk about in the creative world called the infinite cage. If you don't have any constraints, if your choices are infinite, what do you choose? So I like to say when you're writing, when you're writing a piece of music, the hardest note to pick is the first one because the first one can be any note any sound at all from a, a duck fart to a french horn to eight billion people screaming whatever it is it could be anything once you've chosen the first note the second note is going to have a relationship to the first note and that constrains it incredibly do we want to repeat it or do we want to have something different well that's the first question you either play the same note over again or you play some other note as soon as you play a second note you're created a relationship between two notes. As soon as, if you write a word, it's just a word. But if you write two words, the words have a relationship to each other. And even if they don't make sense, our minds will try to make sense of them. Hmm. And that's where a story starts. A story is just a problem. You set up a problem, you try to solve it. We don't have the sandwich. We don't know where the sandwich is. That's our problem. We're trying to find it. So when you're editing these videos, they have to be under two minutes. Uh -huh. Are you ever sad that there's stuff that you have to cut? Because obviously, I imagine you go over a little bit at least, or at least the initial. Oh, oh right, yeah, no, the initial, the initial cut <clears throat> of it, and then you have to edit it and trim it down. What what you find, or what I find, is that trimming it always makes it better. You're getting you're getting rid of stuff that you can live without, and if you can live without it, it's going to be better without it. Um, uh, someone once told me a story. A story is like a wagon. There are things that sit in the wagon and there are things that pull the wagon forward. The more things that sit in the wagon, the harder it's going to be to pull the wagon forward. Mm. So you want to cut out anything that you don't need to get the wagon to roll forward. And it's always going to be better that way. So, yeah, I mean, sometimes, oh, yeah, that was good, but we can only have one of those. So one of them's got to go. But but the knowledge that the end product is going to be better just just buoys you over that kind of stuff. It's interesting because a lot of creatives that I speak to, uh, composers being a big one, is they actually like having deadlines. Otherwise, they never finish. <laughs> so they might be working on a musical piece and they'll be working on it for days, sometimes weeks. And if they don't have a deadline, important. then right. you, you can just keep working on it forever. I think that it's important for 
to be successfully creative, to have goals, to have discrete goals. Um, it can't just be, I want to write or I want to write music or something like that. It needs to be, oh, I want to do one of these. And I envision it as being about this long. And I envision it by, you know, with this many characters, or this many players and, and, and make it work within some kind of structure. Um, with, with live performance, that gives you uh, an easy set of those because, you know, some pe people aren't going to put up with, with a piece of music that's eight and a half hours long. They're going to want to go do something else. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, and usually they're going to put up with something that's between two and 10 minutes long. And then they want a whole bunch of those in a row where they can go off to the bathroom between and stuff like that and, and do what they need to do. Um, uh, but yeah, yeah. I, uh, I mean, it's just a very complex relationship between really wanting to tell the truth and not having any constraints on that at all. And yet needing to communicate which means how long am I going to talk before I let somebody else talk? You know, yeah. because we want to be in conversation. We don't want to just be talking to ourselves. Well, hey, I, I appreciate you doing this. So everyone can follow you on Twitter. Is that, yeah, is that the main place? John Twitter? Patrick Lowry on Twitter. John Patrick Lowry on Facebook. And John Lowry on uh, on uh, YouTube. And, uh, you know, if you do any kind of search for sandwich stuff, you'll find me. It'll be easily. there. Yeah. Well, and John I hope to see you in Australia in October. Yeah, so do I. That'd be yeah. great. I'll, I can, I can take you out for lunch, maybe. <laughs> That'd be great, man. That'd be <laughs> yeah. great, Reese. All right, well that's the show, everyone. Make sure you share, like, and subscribe. And until next time, stay safe.